Welcome to the Solar Builder Buzz, where we give our two cents per kilowatt on the distributed solar market. And today we'll be discussing the commercial and industrial solar space with Paul Grana, GM of Helioscope at Aurora Solar. And Paul, it feels like I've written the same lead sentence about CNI Solar for as long as I've been writing about solar. Uh, you know, so much opportunity, but a variety of challenges keep holding it back. Um, and I, I wanted to highlight a few, but I'm curious what you're hearing from CNI solar installers, you know, what are they saying about their business in the market right now? In some ways, it feels like, yes, there are a bunch of constraints for CNI solar and they haven't gotten better in the last five years, but they've gotten to be more transparent because I guess, um, the, you know, like take something like, um, uh, you know, grid interconnections and the queues to kind of get, get a, a scaled solar plant connected to the grid. Hasn't gotten any better. In fact, it's gotten worse. But you've seen a lot more visibility to that a lot more understanding of that a lot more discussion of that um and you've started to see at least some conversations around some of the planning that we might that might get us through to some some solutions there so one bright spot that i've written about even before the ira was passed was how uh, financiers were getting more comfortable with mid-market solar projects. And I'm curious how much of a role front-end design plays in that financing bankability end of things. First is just using a good model um, in the sense that all through a project lifecycle, there are decisions being made at every step along the way, including just whether to engage with a, with a potential uh, customer or not, um, which sites are attractive or not, which technologies are attractive on those sites. And um, one of the things that's, that's most important is that you want to make sure that you're using kind of the core fundamental math all the way through the project lifecycle. Now, the requirements of the model that you're using are going to change, right? Like early on, you need something that can be used everywhere, that can be updated quickly, that is quite transparent and has only enough knobs to get you through the funnel. At the very end stage, you want something that can be really dialed in, that has many, many, many more knobs because now you're looking to dial in impacts on the order of a tenth of a percent, which is why we still see PV Syst used for the final step. And that's totally fine and understandable because it's really a fundamentally different tool from what people need in the early stages when you're actually engaging with a customer, where you're figuring out how to answer all your biggest uncertainty. And as far as we're concerned, that's where most of the value is created in the solar industry and most of the pain exists in the solar industry. The biggest sources of uncertainty, risk, and loss happen in the early and mid parts of the funnel. That's that's where things are, you know, kind of won and lost. And especially for the medium to small sized CNI projects, the smaller you get, the less it makes sense to to roll a truck and do a really good comprehensive site walk, drone survey, et cetera. And so um, LIDAR plays a really nice role in giving you a set of data. It might not be the only set of data, but once again, what we're really talking about is a multi-step process with multi-steps of a funnel, and it's playing it over multiple months. Having that LIDAR data early to, again, get to a fatal issue earlier, right? Like again, moving a fatal issue up from step six to step one is huge in terms of saving you time and just a way to give you a second set of data, right? Like even if you might be doing a drone survey later, now you have something to sort of compare and contrast that drone data with. To dig a little further into um, the, one of the, you know, the, the core issues that can plague the CNI project, and I mean, any solar project is underperformance, lost revenue. And we often that can be tied to operations and maintenance and, you know, keeping things going uh, long term. But and you talked about it, about it a little bit already, but, you know, what needs to be done in the design phase to make sure that we aren't over promising and under delivering? Being really aware of what resource you're using, both whether whether source, whether vendor within the source type um, and what what flavor of the of the actual resource? You know, are you looking at P50 or P90 or something else? Then another element is um, where design can kind of help is design for maintainability. I, I only flag that because there are cases as we really, especially in CNI, 
generally speaking, you want to pack as much power density on the roof as possible. You want to, in an ideal world, you want to tile the entire roof with solar modules. But tiling the whole roof means, okay, well, how are we going to actually maintain this thing? You know, let's assume there's going to be an issue. How are we going to access that issue? How are we going to diagnose um, and troubleshoot and 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 resolve it? And so um, there is a way in which the maintenance requirements are a are somewhat at odds of the of the sort of general economics, because again, the bigger you get, the better the economics are of that system because you've got fixed costs, right? So if you can make the system 20% bigger, all of your fixed costs are roughly 20% less expensive on a per watt basis. So bigger is better, um, but there are some real trade-offs in terms of O&M. Do you have any more examples of a less considered issue here that could impact a system long-term? Think about under voltage issues. Um, Depends on the module technology, but in many cases, module degradation happens in voltage, not current. So to the extent that it happens in voltage, if your string voltage is going to be falling over time, then you don't want to be hitting the lower end of your inverter's voltage range. Under voltage at the string level can have significant impact on energy production, more so than over voltage. If you're driving the voltage higher than the inverter wants, um, the sort of delta in power versus delta in voltage, like the, the impact on power, it's actually a relatively soft part of the curve, but IV curves are very steep when, you're, when your string is too low and the inverter can't follow your string voltage down. If you're, if you're starting out at the design stage in the low end of the inverter's voltage range, and then the modules degrade, um, you could see fairly material impact on system performance. And so, and again, keep in mind that like, this is going to happen at the peak part of the day because within any particular day the hotter it gets the voltage sags and so if you're if you're if you're having having an under voltage issue not only is the curve very sharp at that it's it, it, like the, the the slope the slope is very steep but it's happening at the hottest part of the day which obviously is also going to be this going to tend to be the sunniest part of the day so and to your point on the looking long term not uh, not just for keeping the system up and performing, but for that customer's journey, their electrification journey, adding EVs, maybe adding storage. Did that change the trend for the systems that we are pitching now? Because I know we do want to pack as much power as we can on that rooftop, but if we kind of have the idea that we're going to be in this customer's lives longer term, they're going to be adding more, should we maybe, I don't know, go on the uh, smaller side to start and kind of ease in, knowing that we're going to be following up down the road? Does that make sense? Is that anything we're seeing or no? In a commercial system, the load is not the constraint, generally speaking. And so given that, there's really no benefit at all to undersizing a system today. And again, I'm talking about undersizing the PV element of a system. Yeah. Um, but if you're going with PV, generally speaking, more is better. Now, one way to then kind of flip that around, you might pitch other um, ways of adding more PV. So again, this gets to be super site specific, but if you've got parking, shade structures in the parking lot, also awesome ways of, of, of deploying solar. Um, and uh, generally speaking, again, I don't think this is a controversial statement, generally speaking, they tend to be a little more expensive on a per watt basis. Um, and so maybe that's not your first option, but you frame it to the customer as, hey, this is another thing, we can do this, you know, these are your two options, you know, rooftop only, rooftop plus carports. And then kind of to your point, maybe the way you kind of think about that, if you're thinking about the overall lifestyle, like, you know, if you're kind of customer life cycle is, okay, hey, look, phase one, we're gonna do this. Phase two, if you wanna get to EVs, actually carports can be a really nice fit with the EVs. Let's do that all together. It's gonna, you know, this is what the budget of that's gonna look like, et cetera. So you might, you might in that case, yes, do a version of phase one PV deployment, phase two PV deployment. I'm just drawing the distinction between staging up parts of a roof versus staging out complete sections of that commercial real estate. Another thing we've already kind of touched on, the, the issue of going back and forth with multiple designs, change orders, um, and maybe you discover that fatal flaw later in the process could lose a job. And then if you've already done all that work, it hurts extra because you've invested so much time in that project and lost man hours, all that. Um, are there any innovations or process efficiencies that you'd like to highlight that commercial installers should be implementing to tighten up that design phase or those knobs that we were talking about earlier, making sure that they're use, utilizing them to avoid 
the, that really inefficient process I was just talking about. Things like LIDAR is one. Um, outside of scope of heliscope, but date, it, drones, I've talked about drones as another you know area of, do you use these things? Where and when do you use these things? Maybe even before, like, do you use them before you engage with the customer, during that first site visit, after the first site visit? There's no right or wrong answer, but they're actually important questions in the way that there's no right or, there's no single right answer to set up a factory. But the way you set up a factory, if you're going to be running a factory, is actually super important. Like, you should really have a point of view on what you're doing and why. And as I, as, as I was saying earlier, a lot of these are just human types of pain that there's no there's no silver bullet to make them go away. It's just a matter of managing them. There are certain advantages to, to some of these things of being cloud-based, right? Um, you take something like P90, it's easier to um, work with weather vendors who you might be able to um, just have a, a faster, more streamlined process because it can be cloud-based as opposed to having to sort of fire emails around and having version control issues, et cetera, et cetera. You can have multiple people at the same company or multiple people at multiple companies using the same product, um, You know, looking at design iterations, really kind of getting through that iteration process as much as you can, as early as you can. Further to that, we've heard of some people who are, for example, using Slack. You might have a Slack channel with um, with with a distributor's kind of sales team, so you can in as quickly as possible understand what kind of you know lead times availability are we looking at, and or Slack channels with customers, so you can have a good you know as synchronous as possible with your with your actual customers um, as they're as they're really getting working through their questions. So, Paul. At as a final thought here, you know, it's uh, what's next, uh, you know, what's another crucial advancement in CNI solar? I think that um, microgrids are, on, again, on a five to 10 year horizon, um, we're going to see more and more of them. The intuition is just that, especially with EV charging, we're going to start to see loads that are multiples of what the grid can handle. And then at that point, it's going to become a question of what does it cost to upgrade the grid to allow me to do what our customers want us to do? Or do we island this and figure this out on its own so that we can have a certain level of EV charging penetration with peak load of X, even though the grid capacity at this node is X divided by 20? Um, and you know, we want to we want to kind of untether ourselves so that we can solve this. And then finally, just um, uh, the last one that maybe this is maybe on the aspirational side is overbuild. And really here, all I'm really talking about is something that's pretty common at the utility scale world, where people increasingly are understanding that modules are so cheap. And, and really, what I what I what I really mean in that statement is the entire DC part of the power plant modules, racking, conductors, and the labor associated with getting those installed are so cheap that um, instead of the traditional DC to AC ratio where you say, okay, well, if I have, you know, whatever, five megawatts of inverter capacity, I'm going to have, what, what is it, you know, maybe six, six and a half megawatts of, of DC capacity. Instead, you're saying, okay, well, let's build up to seven megawatts or eight megawatts of DC capacity. So really overbuilding the amount of modules you have which means that you are going to be clipping power at the peak parts of the day in the summertime when that eight megawatt system is producing seven and a half megawatts, but the inverter is only going to pass through five megawatts to the grid. Um, and so again, this is a pretty common mindset in utility scale. But um, I could, you know, like there are going to be, or I shouldn't say are, but there might be cases where that kind of approach works in the CNI world as well. And again, in, you know, today we don't see it as much, just because, like I said, most often you're constrained by the roof, to, the, the the space, more so than the grid. And hopefully, we can find more creative ways of finding more space. Um, and or the negative side is more of if the grid becomes constrained, we still might say, okay, well, if we can only connect up, uh, you know, two megawatts to the grid at this one spot. Um, then I'm still going to maybe build a four megawatt DC plant and just have a two to one DC AC ratio, and you know it's still going to make a better better sort of uh, uh, system economics overall. So um, again, that 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 kind of a ratio is still a little aspir like that's not happening today, but that's my sort of aspirational. What what might the future look like? Very good. Uh, hey, well, Paul, uh, thanks for stopping by the buzz and doing this deep dive into CNI Solar with me today. Appreciate it. And, you know, good luck with everything over there at Helioscope. Totally. Great to chat, Chris.